If you guys will turn your Bibles over to Romans 11. Romans 11, and the part of the scripture we're going to focus on is there in uh, verse 1 through 7. I mean, verse 1 through 8. So if you'll turn your Bibles over to Romans 11, and we'll read those first eight verses right there. Romans 11 says uh, there, this is the scripture we're focused on. It says in Romans 11, 1, it said, the Bible says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh interception to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as, as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And so the title of my message today is, There is a Remnant. And it's found there in verse, uh, in verse 5 of Romans 11. It says, Even so then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And the reason that uh, I'm preaching this, well, you know, Wednesdays is a good time to preach a biblical uh, message, a Bible study on any book of the Bible. And, uh, you know, but the, there's twofold, there's a twofold purpose to this. The, the main purpose of the message is actually an encouraging message. And the reason I'm going to, and I'm going to explain why this message specifically, but also in the context of studying things, you always want to point out what the Bible is actually saying in, in, in certain scriptures. And, you know, we're going to touch a little bit on Judaism and just, you know, uh, the religion of uh, Judaism and the Jews and things like that. Because Romans 11 is one of those uh, chapters of the Bible that Christianity as a whole uh, uses to justify why we should be behind, for example, the people of Israel. Unfortunately, you know, if you read it in context, you know, God's talking specifically to those that are spiritual. And we see that in those verses right there. It says uh, in verse number six, it says, if, if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more, right? Uh, but if it is of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And so the Bible is very clear through and through, and it's amazing how people can fall into a work salvation doctrine when the Bible is clear that it's all by grace. It's through faith. It's not of ourselves. You know, and one of the things that, you, that we run into the most, as a matter of fact, that's the thing that you're going to run into all the time. It, 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 the, the, the devil is wily, and he can, uh, he's subtle, and he's going to lie to you. But the, the lie can, can be masked in, dif in different ways. But the reality is that everything that's not by faith is of works. Whether you're looking to yourself or you're looking to something else to save you, the challenge is if it's not Christ, then it's a work. But uh, we're not going to focus on that right now. The, the, the goal here is, you know, one of the things that I've seen, you know, I'm, I'm probably one of the last few generations. If you were born between 1980 and 95, but really, if you were born between 1980 and 1985, you know, we're called exennials, I think. You know, and, and don't quote me on that. But it's because we're not really the X generation. We're really not the Y generation. We're this kind of weird generation where we were born before the advent of the Internet. And what I mean by that, obviously, if you study the Internet, it's been around a long time. But uh, mass, per, mass uh, consumption of the Internet didn't really come about till like 1993, 1995. And one of the things that really happened with that was the advent of just the speed of information and the speed of things. And so about 20, 20 30 years ago, you started listening to this thing uh, from the older generation saying, you know, these, these young kids, they don't know how to earn anything. It's called instant gratification. And the challenge is that, you know, I don't even really know what to call it now because if that was instant gratification 20, 30 years ago where we just wanted everything now, you know, fast food, 
what uh, we really took off in the 90s. I mean, I know it comes from the 50s and the 60s, but it's not until like the 90s where you see a lot of this because of, you know, being able to buy on the internet, being able to promote through the internet. Then the social media came around in the early 2000s to uh, mid 2000s, and then now you just forget it. With all the media out there, with uh, social media like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Snapchat and whatever else you can name, and you know, I named a bunch of them, and it turns out I don't even know all of them. You know, and I think that I, I try to keep up with things, but these younger generations are just bombarded and consumed with all this stuff. One of the challenges that I think happens is that people that are serving, you know, and, and I'm not, let me first say, I'm not detracting from those that use social media, that use the, the tools available to spread the gospel. As a matter of fact, that's why, you know, Pastor Cobb has encouraged us to do the things that we've done. It's not to get... Uh, recognition. It, it's not so that we get more YouTube hits or Facebook likes or whatnot. It's so that people get the message for those that aren't able to go to churches like this, right? But the challenge with that is that two full, there's two things that happen, and you, you can read study after study. Is there's a lot of people that are on social media and are depressed because they see just the snippet of somebody else's life. And, you know, in social media, the, the challenge, the only negative about social well that's not the only but the main negative is that you can portray your life however you want it you know you you know with photoshop and clipping pictures and videos you can make yourself seem really cool and when it comes to the ministry a lot of people you know they get drawn by those that are doing great things for god and and it's great that they're doing great things for god but if you look at this right here the bible says god says look and I, I didn't call it because I didn't want to be hokey, but now in the message I can be hokey. The reason that I named it There Is a Remnant is because we want to be biblical. But really, we could have also named this message, You're a Superstar or You're a Hero in God's Eyes. See, the challenge is God kept a remnant. See, this message isn't about Elijah as much as it is about those that we don't know their names. God didn't give us the name of the 7,000 men that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal, to the image of Baal. You know, all we see is Elijah, and Elijah's there, and he's like, you know, I'm the only one, Lord. And in the ministry, number one, anybody who's ever served in church, who's ever uh, gone out soul winning, who's ever just done anything that required, you know, served in the church, educated, you know, kids or whatever, even if you just cleaned the church, the one thing that happens is, number one, at some point in your life, you're going to feel like you're the only one. And then the other challenge that we're going to run into is in good churches like this one, you know, our numbers aren't as big as, you know, the, the churches that are, have the drums and the big lights and everything. And so then you just feel like you're the only one. That's number one. But number two is uh, other times also when you're sitting behind the pews, and I know for a fact because I was one of those that sat in the pews and listened to these great works of men of God, and I remember listening and being like, man, I just don't know if I could ever be that guy. You know, and I was young in, in, in the Word, and I didn't, hadn't studied it like I did. And one of the things that you see is God always leaves a remnant, and, you know, they're not always on the, on the spotlight. They're not always on the front page. You know, I mean, the uh, Southern Baptist Convention has not only been on the front page, but they've been all over the world as of Sunday when Pastor told me about that article that the San Antonio Express and the Houston Chronicle did on all the negative uh, that's happened, you know, and all the things. But in, in even the Southern Baptist Convention, there's still people that are saved by grace that are serving. And they're probably feeling right now like, whoa, I'm the only one. And, you know, this message rings true to any of those who just serve. And sometimes, you know, you just, you feel like you're not getting the recognition. Don't worry about it. God knows. God told, you know, Elijah, hey, there's still 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee. To the image of Baal. He's like, look, let me, let me point some things out to you here. And then he used it as an encouragement for those that are on the front lines, that do have a little bit more of a spotlight on them. So it goes both ways. And it's real important that we understand our, our, our role in the church and that we understand that everybody who's saved by grace, you know, God has a, a microscope on you. He's numbered, you know, your, the hairs on your head. And you're special in His eyes, and you should never feel like what you're doing for the Lord is not producing results. And so let's go ahead and let's, let's focus on this study. 
And then I'm, we'll touch a little bit on Romans 11 and, you know, just kind of what Paul is saying here in context also. But, you know, the first thing is that happens a lot. People will feel discouraged and alone. You know, one of the things that you see uh, if you grew up watching television at all, you know, I'm of the generation that grew up watching television, is, you know, one of the themes whenever they're trying to make these real uh, dramatic emotional movies is, you know, people are like, oh, I just feel alone. Nobody understands me. I just feel like I'm out here in the world alone. But the Bible is, is totally different, right? And, and God addresses your loneliness in a very specific and special way. Let's, let's look at, uh, go to 1 Kings. And we're really just going to be in 1 Kings and, and in Romans. We're not going to jump around uh, too much like, uh, uh, like we normally do. But just folks there, we, we might turn to Philippians at the end. But uh, if you go to 1 Kings 18 and turn there with me, because uh, let's set this up. You know, this is... Uh, we sometimes we have these big highs in life, but what happens after the highs, you have these big lows. And, and the men of God in the Bible weren't any different. And so we see here Elijah, and Elijah, you know, in 18, I'm not going to go through it all, but, you know, he's basically uh, challenged the false prophets of Ahab, you know, basically to a, let's see whose God is bigger. Remember when you were in school and, uh, you know, you're about between the ages of five and eight, that's at least when I can remember happening to me, is my daddy can beat up your daddy, or my daddy does better than your daddy. That's kind of like, the, that, that's kind of what's going on right here, you know, in a, in a very simplistic form. But if you look there, and just look at verse 27, Elijah now has finished challenging, uh, and he's challenging these false prophets of Baal, and in verse 27 it says, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry out loud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awaked. And they cried out loud, and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets, till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass, when midday was past, that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, and I want you to pay attention to that voice right there, there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. So we see that Elijah, man, he's, he's kind of like, he's on it. He's ripping face. He's letting these guys know. He's mocking their gods. I mean, think about the display. You know, it's 450 of them. And this is, here's Elijah mocking, saying, hey, where's your God? Where's your guy? And then we see in verse 37, he says, hear me. So, you know, they fail. They fail miserably. And so now it's Elijah's turn, and he sets this thing up, and he pours the water. And, I mean, this thing looks like you couldn't light it if you wanted to, right? And he gets God to light the offering. And in verse uh, 37, he says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And so we see right there, first of all, who are they focusing on now that they've, if they've seen this thing? They've believed on the Lord Jesus on God Almighty, right? It says, now that they turn their back heart again, uh, their heart back again, verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. So they called upon the name of the Lord, basically. I mean, I mean they, they had this, uh, you know, you've heard that term, this come to Jesus meeting, right? We, you know, in, in business, I used to hear that all the time. But here, they've literally come to the realization that this is the Lord. And what's happening is, Elijah's really trying to prove to the people of Israel, hey, you guys are going astray following after Ahab. You know, let's get this thing going. So Elijah's really trying to do this work. He's being a soul winner in, in the message, right? And, and he's got this thing going on. He wins this battle shortly after that. You know, he takes out and he kills all the prophets. And then the word Ahab goes back. And, and I'm pretty sure he went back uh, crying like a baby because we see that earlier when he takes away the land, right? You know, Ahab kind of had this bad attitude the whole time. Not only did he have a bad attitude, but he also was the worst king that they, they had seen at the time. And it says uh, in verse, go, just turn over one page in verse 19, I mean, uh, uh, chapter 19 and verse 1 and we see what happens here and this is where this is the point where I'm telling you so he had this big high 
I mean, he just faced 450 false prophets of Baal. He took them out. I mean, he killed them. There was bloodshed. This is a, a gruesome scene. And then immediately after it says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withhold how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. So Ahab's like gossiping and moping to his wife. And he's like, Then Jezebel sent a mes messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. So we see after this big high, he has this humongous low. I mean, he's at the point of death. He's like, just, just kill me. You know, one of the questions we ask people when we're out soul winning is sometimes to make the point of how it's eternal is, you know, we'll use examples of well, what if you committed a horrible sin in the future and we'll let them answer. Or if they, if they don't give an answer, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, especially if I know they're Catholic, is, you know, what if in two or three years you got depressed and you killed yourself? You know, what, what would happen then if you, if you died? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And, you know, people don't know how to answer that. And so what they end up doing is um, uh, what people don't, they don't know how to answer the question. So what happens is we'll ask them, you know, if you were to die today or if you were to kill yourself in two years or three years, you know, it's just an example, you know, what would happen to you? Where would your soul go, heaven or hell? You know, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, where would you go? And right away, most people, especially if they're Catholic background, they're like, oh, we're going to go to hell. So then we, that's where we reiterate. And, you know, it just depends on the person. It, we'll overcome that objection and we get it. But the one thing that's clear is it's a good example because what, guess what happens in life? Life's tough. You know, life has a ton, a, a ton of ups and downs. And one of the things that's going to happen in life is there's times when people just feel like it's, they're at the end of the road. You know, there's tragedies in life. There's things that happen. There's loss of life. There's loss of family members. There's loss of money. There's loss of jobs. And there's times when you just get to God and you're like, he says, oh, Lord, take away my life, for I, I am not better than my father's. I mean, Elijah, this great prophet of God, I mean, he's probably one of my favorite characters in the Bible, just gets up there, and he's, he's at the end. He's like, that's it, I'm done. You know, so there's, first of all, if you ever have those thoughts, who do you seek? Seek God. Because, I mean, one of the challenges you run into here in the, in the United States is suicide is rampant throughout the world. And this suicide is rampant here in, in America. And, I, and I, I believe it has to do with our focus is in the wrong place. Look, Elijah went and took it to God. And let's look at how God responds, you know, because he's discouraged and alone. But what is God? God is patient and powerful. His initial response isn't what maybe some of our responses would be. His initial response is loving and caring before he gives them the, the calling, before he gives them the directive, before he gives them... The, the direction he needs to go. Let's look at verse 5. He says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at, at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. See, the, God knows that sometimes the journey is too great for us. You know, that's why I can't stand, you know, modern Christianity. And by the way, the majority of people that claim the name of Jesus and they say they're Christian are probably not Christian. And we know that because the Bible says that narrow is the way. So I'm not making a blanket statement just out of context. The I mean, Bible gives us there are few that enter therein at the gate. It's not many, it's few. Few me is less than many. So the majority of people aren't that. And, but right here, the, the reason that I, I don't like this uh, mainstream Christianity is because, you know, you just get all these blanket statements. Like I've heard things, you know, you hear things like, oh, God hates the sin, but, you know, loves the sinner. We, that's not anywhere in the Bible. God hates the sinner if we're sinning against them just as much as anybody who sinned. I mean, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're condemned already, right? But the thing that he, that the other thing that you hear a lot is you'll hear people say, oh, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. Sometimes God gives you more than you can handle. Let me just say, 
that the only the reason he's giving you more you can handle is because the only one that's going to handle it is God. See, the challenge is we want to be the superheroes. We want to be the ones that are on the forefront. We want to be the stars. And God's saying, look, that's not, that's not what's important to me. And I'm going to tie this all together because there is a remnant even to this day. See, Elijah's focused on the wrong thing, but God knew how to redirect his folks, right? Let's go down to verse 9. Um, oh, well, verse 8 says, And he arose and did eat and drink and went in strength for that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And then verse 9 says, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou there, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. So it's a good thing. He's jealous of God. You know, he wants people to know who God is, right? It says, For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And sometimes when we're out in the forefront, you know, those people that have the record, and I'm not talking about it. I'm just saying you hear that kind of accusation like they're the only ones or their church or their group of people are the only ones that are out there doing the hard work for the Lord, right? That's what he's saying. You know, when he's talking about Israel there, he's talking about those that he believes are of the tribe of, like, God's people. I'm not talking about those that uh, that worship in the religion of Judaism. That's why we're going to tie it to Romans 11. But he, I'm not talking about false Jews. He's saying, For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. What he's saying is, Oh, well, you know, here at Spring Crest, oh, Pastor Cobb, you know, all those church members that show up, man, they just, they've gone down the beaten path. I mean, Super Bowl Sunday, half of them didn't even show up. You know, and I mean, we can't even get him to show up on Sunday night. Or I mean, that's basically the attitude he's taking here. He says, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So, I mean, he's like, look, Lord. I mean, he's actually making a, plea, a good plea in his eyes, but he's thinking he's the only one left. He thinks there's nobody else that believes like he does. And verse 11, he says, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break uh, in pieces the rock before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Now remember, the false prophets of Baal, uh, of Baal I'm sorry, they didn't hear a voice. But Elijah, he heard a voice. It said, And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? So he asked him again. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. You know, he has a, a, a practiced response. You know, they, he got his story straight with himself. You know, when you, whenever you're trying to give a good answer, what do you do? You, you practice the story. When, I remember when, we were, when we were kids, my brother and I, if we ever did anything really dumb, like we, we, we put holes in the walls and we broke uh, ceiling fans. I mean, we did I remember one time we, we dropped a whole TV. And, you know, this is a, the day before flat TVs. So, you know, my brother and I were fighting and Somehow we, we got caught on the court and this big TV just fell on us. Luckily it didn't hurt us, but we put it back up and tried to figure out, you know, we'd get our story straight. Elijah had his story straight. He responds the same way again. He says, and I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And how does the Lord respond? Uh, let's go. So the Lord is, he's, first of all, he's patient before we get to the response, right? And, and he's powerful. He's saying, there's a couple of things that I'm going to show you here, Elijah. Number one, even though you're at the end of this, I'm not going to address this right now. And, you know, th it's a good, encouraging thing to know that when we feel like we've come to the end of the rope, God's patient with us and he wants us to get, get right. And, you know, in this sense, he fed him and he let him rest and he gave him 40 days and 40 nights. And our, it, it, you know, we can translate it to tonight. Look, sometimes don't quit coming to church and don't quit reading your Bible but maybe at times, you know, just give it some time for God to work things out with you. You know, unfortunately, when we're at the end of our rope, uh, we're not patient enough to give God the let God give the answer, right? Well, I've heard that saying all my life. 
You know, he's seldom early but never late. You know, that holds true to the fact that God has to give efforts time to compound. You know, he let him build up his strength to be able to do and answer the way he was going to answer to him. If you go to verse 18, you know, of, of 1 King, the next, the final point here is just God perseveres and saves so many, so we all, uh, God preserves, I'm sorry, and saves us so we may all persevere. And what I mean by that is it goes both ways. You know, he preserves a remnant because he's God. And that's what he said he was going to do. And many will always be saved. See, Christianity will never be destroyed. Right? Christianity will, will, will be here until Jesus returns. You know, there is a group out there that hates Jesus. You know, there, Satan wants to destroy Christianity. Satan is so arrogant and so pompous and so overconfident, so prideful that he thinks he can destroy Christianity. But God says there's always a remnant. And number one is we should focus that if we're not the ones getting the recognition, if we're not the ones in the spotlight, it doesn't matter because God knows that you're his remnant. And he's going to use that for his purpose. But the other way, it goes the other way too, is for those that might have a more responsibility or might be in a position of more leadership, remember the remnant's there to remind you that you're not the only one and that you have people you can lean on, right? Look, look at what he says in verse 19. He says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Who left the, the remnant? God did. You know, sometimes that's, that we don't have to understand, and it, we'll close out with that verse in Romans eleven thirty three. but we don't have to understand why God does things a certain way. What we have to understand is that there is a purpose for our lives. You know, we might not be Moses. We might not be the modern day Elijah or even Elijah, because at the end of 1 Kings 19 is when God says, look, you're going to go appoint these kings. And I liken it to also when you're going to go appoint or ordain these ministers, right? And then he chooses Elijah. You know, it's like Paul and Timothy that you got Elijah and Elijah. And it took me forever to get those right, but I finally got them right. You know, Elijah and Elijah. But he gets a lot, you know, that was appointed of God after this big downfall. And then we know the rest of the story, right? If we were to read 1 Kings 19, you know, he does great things for God. And then he gives Elijah a double, a double portion of his spirit. And Elijah is able to carry on that ministry that, that, he, that he started out. But if you go back to Romans, go back to Romans and just flip over to Philippians 3. while you're Keep your finger there in Romans. But we see the same thing there. And God's using this to explain in the same way. He says, look, it's the same thing many thousands of years later. And he uses Paul to explain it. And you know what? He's using me to explain it today. And then in, in many, many more years, somebody else will explain it. Because, you know, there's no new thing under the sun. As a matter of fact, if, if somebody gets up and preaches something that they think they figured out that nobody else has figured out, I would probably advise that you get up from your pew and walk out that door. Because, I mean, nobody's preaching anything new. The Bible's true and through. And God already, everybody's preached what needs to be preached. We just, we have to expound for those that are coming up in the world. But right there in Romans 11.4, he says, But what saith the answer of God unto him? This is when he asked of Elias what he, you know, what he, uh, why he, what he was uh, doing. And let's go, let's get this in context. So we, Romans, uh, Romans 11.3, 11.2, he says, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. To who did he reserve them? To God. See, those people probably nobody knew their names. See, Elijah had this big victory. I mean, 450 prophets, he slew all of them. I mean, it was a spectacle. The people of Israel were watching. This is a big deal. This is like, like watching uh, Election Day, you know, or something like that. But there were 7,000 there whose, pe whose names were not even mentioned. And, you know, today there's thousands, and I probably believe there's probably hundreds of thousands of Christians. We're never going to know their names. 
And we're never going to know what they've done for the Lord. But you know who knows? God. And that's probably the most important lesson that I want to leave is that God's the one that's using, He preserves us in His grace through faith so that we can persevere. Because we don't know what life's going to, you know, if I were to re, re, recant, and I mean recant, if I were to just tell you my 39 years, it's amazing the things that I've done and the things that I've experienced. And, and it's not a bragging thing. Everybody who's tried to do anything in life, I mean, if you've tried to just be successful, and then after that, if, you've, if you were saved by grace and you try to be just work for the Lord, you're going to experience pretty cool things. But guess what? In that process, I've also experienced some pretty you know, sad and depressing things. Things that just discourage me and just put me like, what am I even doing? Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? And God says, look, He's preserved me and He's preserved you and He's preserved anybody else who's called upon the name of the Lord for Himself. He says, I've reserved, what did He say? He says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Go to Philippians 3 and then uh, we'll close out. It says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 3 verse 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So what are we talking about here? The reason that, why are we going to Philippians 3? This is how, because it's specific. And the reason I'm, I'm going to tie this to Judaism is because we have to know who God is talking to here. God is talking to those that are saved by grace. And he made it available to all of us. And once we know how to do that, then we can work better for the Lord after our salvation. Paul, in Romans 11, says that he is of the tribe of Benjamin, that he is, you know, a Jew of the Jew. And in Philippians 3, he actually gives us like this long uh, history or resume of who he really is. But we're going to see how he ties it to the grace of Christ, what it all means for him. It says, it says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. So it's interesting that he's tying these guys. He's like, look, beware of these sodomites. Beware of these false prophets or evil workers. Beware of the concision. Beware of these guys that are trying to split up, you know, the church and uh, spread lies and do all these things. It says, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in spirit. Why did he mention the circumcision? Because, you know, that, that's a big thing for the Jews. You know, the if they're circumcised or not circumcised, they're, they're going uh, to the, the uh, old uh, Levitical laws. But the reality is, God looks at the circumcision of the heart. And that's from the Old Testament. If you really read the Old Testament context, God mentions the circumcision of the heart in the Old Testament as much as He mentions it in the New Testament. And it says, And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh if any other man thinketh, that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul's now saying, look, going back to Romans 11, I told you I was a, a, of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, I'm a Jew of Jews. If anybody can, can put their stock in that, it's me. Look, I'm first generation, second generation, third generation preacher. I'm first generation doing whatever ministry I'm in. You know, you, that, that's what he's doing. He's putting his stock. He's giving his resume. But what does he say? circumcised of the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews is touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And let, let's focus there on verse 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And the reason that, we fo that I want to focus on that is because there is a ton of people that claim to be Christian. And if we put our, if we lean on them, and their false gospel to encourage us, we're going to fail just as much as they will. Now, your salvation, once saved, always saved. But if you're trying to do great things for Christ, who do you lean on? You lean on God. See, Elijah, the only, you know, we can, we can point out the negative that he did, right? That he's like, woe is me, I'm the only one. But the positive, who did he take, who did he take his plea to? He didn't take it to 
you know, the Christians for uh, Israel or Fox News Baptist or, you know, evangelicals for Trump. No, he took it to God. He said, look, I'm at the end of my rope and God answered, right? God said, I'm going to handle this. But he says, the, he says uh, there in verse 9, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. See, God has a remnant even today, and we have to be careful because I believe that even though there's scores of individuals that are saved by grace, our numbers are smaller than what the world is. And then what we want to do is we want to focus and encourage those and let them encourage us that we might, we might not ever get any spotlight. But you know what? God knows the work we're doing for Him. That's the important thing, right? The remnant is the one that God has preserved for Himself to do the work that is for Him. You know, He says, His word goeth out, but in unreturned void. See, the, too many times we're the ones that are trying to stand on our own laurels or we're trying to then do what, you know... Uh, Paul was saying, look, I'm of the stock of Israel. I mean, I ran into a guy just this Sunday, and I, and I, I mean, honestly, I read him wrong. I'm, I, I think I'm pretty good at reading people because I come from a business background, but every once in a while, you know, people get it wrong. And I read this guy completely wrong. I knocked on the door, and I saw his face, and I asked him the question, you know, are you 100% sure if you die today, you're going to heaven? And the way he reacted, I thought he was ripe for the picking. And then... And then immediately he reached like right here to his, uh, he had a necklace and it was the, the star of David, which is the star of Revenant. Re, Ref, Ravna, I, I, excuse me, it's a false god. And I, and I always pronounce it correct. And of course I'm up here and I'm going to pronounce it right. But he, he reached over for the star of David and then he said to, he said to me, literally he said, well, I don't have to do anything to get saved because I'm an Ashkenazi Jew, which actually if you even study that, that's even worse than, I mean, there is no, like back in the day, like in Paul's day, he could at least say he's of the tribe of Israel, I mean, of Benjamin, you know, an Israel of the stock of, uh, you know, a Pharisee, a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews. But today, you know, generation after generation, to be tied to like a, you know, if we were to do a DNA test, we'd all have a little bit of everything. But he's like, no, I've done the research and I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. Well, if you know anything, Ashkenazi Jews are from a region up in the Turkey area, you know, over there in the Russian area. But he said, so I'm already saved. I said, what do you mean? I mean, I'm the Bible. And I went through and I said, look, what about Galatians 3? What about Romans 11? What? And he's like, no, I'm, I'm saved because, you know, I'm chosen. I'm a chosen one. But what did God say? He says, those that are chosen are of grace, not of works. Unless works is, is no longer works and grace is no longer grace. I mean, if we're going to mix and match them, then either one is out. And then let's go right there uh, before we close out. And the reason we're tying this is because there are people out there who get behind the wrong factions and get behind, behind the wrong groups. What I, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make here is we've got to stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, too many times we get a little nitpicky. And, and we should be careful. We should be separate from the world. But God tells us to be, you know, uh, that we're all members of the same group. Now, our church is our membership, right? We're, we're all the members of Christ here. But if there's other believers that are like-minded, we're members of the whole, of Christ's branch, right? And I'm not going to go through all of Romans 11. But too many times they go one way or the other. And I've said this before, right? If, they, if I don't agree with them on one doctrine... They won't go out and soul win with me. But I'll soul win with anybody. I really will. I mean, as long as they're saved by grace, you know, I, I, and, I, and I do that. But there's a group out there that get behind, for example, and, and, I, and I'm going to, um, behind these guys that say they're Jews or that they are of the religion of Judaism. Well, here's the challenge with that. You know, if you just look up Wikipedia, and, and then we'll close out with this. And I'm, I mean, I could have looked up a time. I just... It's amazing. Wikipedia. And by the way, that's a whole other conversation. For, let's not get sidetracked. But Judaism's view of Jesus from Wikipedia. And it says here, among followers of Judaism, Jesus is viewed as having been the most influential and consequently the most damaging of all false messiahs. However, since the traditional Jewish belief is that the Messiah has not yet come and the Messianic age is not yet present, 
The total rejection of Jesus as either Messiah or uh, deity has never been a central issue of Judaism. Judaism has never accepted any of the claimed fulfillments of prophecy that Christianity is attributed to Jesus. And I'm not going to read that. Basically, they deny Jesus, right? Then there's another thing, they, their oneness. They deny the Trinity. Now you say, why do you say this? Well, number one, we're doing a study, and we started in Romans 11. Well, Romans 11 is a, is a set of scriptures that's used by people that say, you know, if you bless them, God will bless you, and if you curse them, God will curse you. And Because it says here, all Israel will be saved. But the challenge is, who is he specifically talking to? He's talking to those that are of the spiritual uh, seed of Israel, right? Those that walk in the spirit, those that worship in grace, not in the law. Now, why do I say that? Well, look, the region itself, Pastor Cobb has heard me say it, you know, and, and it's in the Bible has a specific part in prophecy, it's going to happen. But what happens is, Everybody wants to get on a bandwagon. I know that because I got on a bandwagon. And people get on and, you know, oh, well, you know, there's two promises, one for these guys and one for these guys. And it becomes a cop-out. It becomes a cop-out for the work that you're doing because what you're doing is you're looking for that recognition. You want to be part of a group that hangs out with uh, the Jews or you want to be a part of the group that hangs out with uh, Trump supporters or you want to be a part of the group that says, hey, Barack is is the new Messiah. I mean, people said that kind of stuff uh, only four or eight years ago. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up, right? But if we look at the right context, who's the group that we should be hanging out with? The remnant of God. The people that God has left here that he's preserved for himself. Well, how do we know that? We know them because we know them by faith. We know them by grace. And the Bible says we'll know their works. Well, there's no better work than when you're out soul winning. There's no better work than when you're out preaching the true word of God. There's no better work than when you're preaching unfiltered, but there is that group that wants to just be on social media or they want to be on the forefront or they want to be on the lights for the things that are wrong. And what happens is, you know, when we're following that kind of path, and this is where I'll close out, we can sometimes get like Elijah, where we've had a little bit of recognition, we've had a little bit of leadership, and we feel like we're the only ones that are doing the work. Nobody works as hard as we do. Nobody does a And then if you're on the other side of the coin, you're looking at those guys and you're like, man, I could never work as hard as that guy. I could never preach as good as that guy. I could never soul win as good as that group. You know, we don't have uh, as many soul winners as that church. Or we don't have as many, uh, you know, ministries as that other church. Or we can't, and what does God say? Look, there's 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee. And if we focus on God, He knows if I'm part of the 7,000, I might not be an Elijah. We might not all be Elijahs, but you know what? We're one of the 7,000. And that's all that matters. If you're important in God's eyes, who cares whose eyes you're important to? I mean, honestly, I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my pastor. I love our congregation. But if you guys don't think I'm important in your eyes and I'm important in God's eyes, well, that's all that really matters. Now, I hope we all line up and we can be important to each other, but God says, look, Elijah, there's remnant. And let me use that to encourage you to go do all this stuff. And he did it, you know, and I'm not going to focus on that. You know, we're not going to close out with that. But let's close out. Go to just Romans 11, verse 33, and we're done. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So when he reminds him of a remnant, he says, look, the depth is just, it's just too much. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. I mean, the bottom line The goal of today's message is to remind ourselves that everything is done through Christ. He is the one that keeps the remnant. He is the one that does the work through us. He is the one that gets the glory. He is the one that gets the credit. He is the one that's coming back and and, going to reign forever. He, it's all for Him. And too many times, too, too often, all of us, I mean, this is just a human nature thing. I'm not pointing any fingers. And if you want to point a finger, point at myself. We become too engrossed in what we're doing and we don't know if and we want to see the results now 
Because if I click like, if I put a post somewhere and nobody likes it, man, I'm not successful. And if I post the video and nobody saw it, I'm not successful. You know, that's the way the world thinks. But what does God say? God says, look, I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at every Sunday that you go out or every time you have an opportunity to preach the gospel. And you know what? When you lead that person to the Lord and nobody else saw it, I know it happened. When you do this and nobody else knows, I know it happened. That's actually probably the greatest celebration that we can have is when the Lord knows, not when everybody else knows. I remember, and I'll close out, I really will close out with this. In 2012 or 2013 when I served in city council, I was a chief of staff for a council member. Pastor Cobb's heard this story, and, I, and I've said it before, but there was a month in July where the council member went to Korea. She was trying to do something for uh, you know, her politics. And that the city of Houston, you know, I served with a conservative, uh, like an ultra-conservative uh, council member. So everybody on city council here in Houston is, you know, Democrat and they're row left. And, you know, we had Anise Parker, the lesbian, serving as mayor. And so they attacked her. And for, for a whole month, there was an article after article. I mean, every day there was like two or three articles about how bad she was and about, you know, how... There was corruption in our office and how I was a cohort and we had all these bad people and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I was stressed out. It was, it was stressful. And I remember uh, telling my wife, man, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. And this is really bad. And I'm not even the council member. And this is the example. I'm not the guy in the forefront. I'm just the chief of staff. I'm just the messenger. And I'm just like, I don't, this, is, this is bad news, babe. I don't know. And I remember she just turned to me real stoic and just looked at me. And she goes, honey, honey, look at me. Cause you know, I'm, I'm all worked up. She goes, just look at me. I said, okay. She goes, honey, you're not that important. And I mean, I mean my, there's nothing like a good wife to set you straight. And she reminded me, it really, we're not that important in the grand scheme of life. We're important to God, not to other people. See, where's our importance? We're that important to God. We're the most important to God, but we focus so much, we turn our importance to something else. We're not that important to the world. As a matter of fact, the world doesn't even care. You know, I, I'm a business consultant. I do great things for some of these doctors that I help out. You know, if I die tomorrow, they're going to replace me. They're, they're going to find somebody to do what I do. You know, if Pastor Cobb and, pa and, and, and Pastor Enrique get up here and preach every Sunday and we don't preach, something happens to us, well, they'll find somebody to replace us. Somebody will get behind this pulpit and preach. It's the work we do for the Lord. You know, the world's going to continue going, but God knows what we did for Him for all eternity. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, Thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. And Lord, I, you know, sometimes it's hard to get these messages across, but I appreciate that, uh, you know, your spirit takes over, Lord. And, and uh, it's my goal that it's your word that carries through and that it's your purpose and your message and that it's for your glory and your honor. I mean, we can never know, uh, like your word says, how unsearch you're so unsearchable. We will never know until probably heaven what, things uh, you've done through us and for us. And uh, I hope this is an uh, encouraging message to those that maybe aren't on the forefront and that aren't in a position of leadership. You've given us a position of leadership in your kingdom, and, and you've given us a task to do. And, and uh, don't let us waste our, our time, but redeem it for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.